I'm plagued by misfortune and death. It's been like this since the day I was born, and it follows me everywhere I go. My mother died during childbirth, and my father died in a tragic accident when I was only four years old. I lived with my grandparents following my father's untimely death. Life was typical for me, or at least as typical as an orphan's life could be. That is until my grandparents died, leaving me alone in the world. My grandfather went first when I was only nine, and my grandmother some years later when I was sixteen. I was alone in the world after that. I peered into the fathomless void of despair every day, at least until I graduated from college. Death had been the only thing I had ever known, and because of that, I became a mortician, or an undertaker, if you will. God knows I had been to enough funerals. By the time I graduated, I found myself in near poverty, having spent my inheritance on attending college. Desperation set in, and I began applying everywhere I could think of. It's not like I had anything holding me back. My job hunt eventually led me to a small funeral home in upstate New York, owned by a man named Gary Mullins. Gary was an interesting character. He appears as though he is a century old, and his mental health is self-admittedly declining. He is a quiet man, but nothing livens him up more than talk of the dead. Much like myself, Gary grew up alone and has no family. He inherited the funeral home after his father died when he was only 13. His uncle curated it until he came of age, and then his uncle tragically passed. Mullen's funeral home was even more an interesting place. The business itself operates out of a house that is 184 years old. It's a large purple house with a wrought iron fence around it. The local kids joke and say that ghosts haunt its halls. I have to give it to them. I used to think the same thing. Alas, no ghosts or ghouls prowl its decrepit old halls. What lurks here is much more corporeal. I will never forget my first day of work at Mullen's funeral home. I vividly remember Gary opening the front door to me and showing me with delight all the pictures of his family members that adorned the walls. The strange thing about this was that these were all post-mortem pictures, taken at funerals and viewings. He spoke as if he was reminiscing on fond memories, but these would have been tragic moments for anyone else. I quickly realized that Gary was a little strange. He made me an offer that I could not refuse, however. He would pay me a yearly salary and allow me to live upstairs in the home, so long as I learned from him and eventually took over the business. I couldn't decline. I remember thinking to myself, this couldn't have gone any better. Naturally, I graciously accepted the old man's offer. This was a great opportunity. I could easily have a career if I just stuck with it. Good, good. He replied to my acceptance of the position before adding, the house always needs an undertaker. That statement baffled me, but I chalked it up as some old tradition that I wasn't yet aware of. Gary told me I would start the following day and told me to go upstairs and get settled in. That wasn't hard. I only had the few possessions that I had kept in my college dorm room. They were all piled in the back of my car. All I had to do was bring them upstairs. Bringing my things inside was a more laborious task than expected. The house had a narrow, twisting spiral staircase leading only upstairs. Navigating these staircases did not prove to be a straightforward task. I finally got all my things up the stairs and chose a room to settle into. My room had high ceilings and beautiful hardwood floors. The furniture in there had to be original. It was as if I stepped into a Victorian time capsule. The room had a unique aroma to it, the scent that you could smell in an antique shop mixed with various herbs. I thought nothing of this smell, however. This was the nicest room I had ever had. It being inside a funeral home didn't much bother me. I don't remember falling asleep, but I remember awaking to a knock on the door. It confused me, considering that the sun hadn't even risen yet. What could that be? I thought to myself. Jason, it's time to go to work. I heard Gary say through the heavy wooden door. I quickly remember that I lived at work now. Yes, sir. I'll be right there. I yelled back, looking down at my phone to check the time. It was four in the morning. I stumbled out of bed and quickly threw some clothes on, then made my way to the door. 
Good morning, son, Gary exclaimed, looking chipper as ever. I, uh, good morning, sir, I replied. I didn't realize that we started this early. I'll make sure I'm up next time. Oh, it's of no concern. Today's a special day. That's why we're up so early, Gary replied, motioning for me to follow him downstairs. As we navigated the winding staircases, I asked, Why is it a special day, Gary? Every Monday is a special day, son. We get to meet so many fresh faces. He replied, Fresh faces? I asked, Yes. That's when the city morgue brings bodies over. Been that way for 46 years. He replied, I wouldn't have been completely in shock if I didn't share the same macabre sense of humor and enthusiasm for the dead. Instead, I was eager. I was excited to meet the new cadavers, excited to practice the skills I had spent the past four years learning, and excited to learn from Gary. As we made it to the bottom of the stairs, we approached a door, hidden by a curtain, behind the central room which is used to conduct services. Gary handed me an old, worn piece of paper before he opened the door. Jason, you'd best read these over before we start. If you follow these rules, you will have a very productive experience here, Gary said as he handed over the piece of paper. I began looking at the piece of paper. Scrawl at the top was Mullins Funeral Home, Undertaker Handbook. Written under this were nine rules. One, always, and I mean always, close their eyes. If you don't, you will sleep for at least a week. Two, keep all limb freezers locked at all times. Three, we deal with a very specific clientele. Always adhere to any last wishes the family may have. We don't want any disgruntled customers. Four, your work days are Monday, 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saturday is for fun. Sunday is for the Lord. You will always work these hours and must be out of the preparation area by nightfall. Five, I permit you to have guests, but they too must follow the next rule. 6. Don't get caught in the halls between the hours of 11 p.m. and 1.31 a.m. 7. The power will go out at exactly 3.36 a.m. This will last until 3.42 a.m. Do not search for the cause of the outage. You would rather not know. 8. Should you hear weeping? Never, under any circumstances, search for the source. No matter how close it sounds, should you look, you will die a most horrific death. 9. Should anyone knock on the door before or after business hours, do not answer it. Uh, Gary? What do these mean? I asked, in complete and utter confusion. Just ensure that you adhere to those. If you do, everything will be just fine. He replied. Before I could say anything else, Gary opened the large metal door in front of us and began walking down the cellar stairs. The first thing that I had noticed was that it was frigid. As we made our way into the cellar, I saw that it was a large open room with several metal tables. Several large metal limb freezers lined one wall. Gary approached one of these freezers, opened the door, and swung it open. He pulled the end of the stretcher inside of the freezer and a corpse slid out. This one was male, mid-fifties. He had short, graying hair and a scruffy beard. I scrutinized the body, looking for what could have brought him to us. A heart attack, Gary's son, while making eye contact with me. Gary lowered the stretcher down and I helped him transfer the body onto a table. The body itself was heavy, just dead weight. We finally got it on a table, and before we could go any further, Gary closed the man's eyes. Rule one, I thought to myself. We spent the next hour draining the blood and finally replacing it with the embalming fluid, as this was going to be an open casket funeral. After that, we diligently prepared the body with makeup and dressing it in clothes it would wear forever. His name is Tony, Gary said out of the blue. When is the service? I asked. Why, it's today, he replied. This took me by surprise. I hadn't expected to run a service so soon. The look of confusion must have shown because Gary's son, well, they don't die on our schedule. As he let out a chuckle, some time passed, but finally, we finished preparing the body. 
We sent him upstairs in the small elevator that we used for cadavers. Next came positioning the casket in the service room and putting him in it. Once we finished this task, we had to prepare the home with artifacts the family had left to be displayed during the service. I made a disturbing discovery when I was hanging photos of our client and his family. The photos they had provided us were all photos of Tony committing gruesome crimes, including mutilating various women. It repulsed me. What kind of monster was this man? Gary, I yelled, looking around for my boss frantically. What's the matter, son? He said with concern in his eyes as he cleared a corner, hurrying towards me. These are what's the matter. What kind of sick joke is this? I demanded to know. Rule three, Jason. He reminded me. Shaken, I remembered rule three. I must always adhere to the client's wishes. I had no way of knowing whether these depraved photos were real. I continued to hang the photos, and when the family finally arrived, I expected repulsion, but it delighted them. They talked openly about how Tony had loved to kill young women and how the world wouldn't be the same without him. I desperately wanted to call the police at that moment. I was in a room full of lunatics. Suddenly, I felt a hand grasp my shoulder. You did well, Jason, Gary said from behind me. I know it can be hard, but we're just undertakers. We don't ask questions. This guy was a murderer, Gary. I snapped back at him in a hushed tone. Was, my dear Jason. Was. He replied calmly. Eventually, we transported the corpse to the cemetery and lowered it into the ground. I can't say that I wasn't happy to see that scumbag go underground. He was a sick, perverted psychopath. The world would be better off without him. Eventually, we made it back to the funeral home. When we went downstairs to make sure that everything was locked up, we discovered that there was a limb freezer hanging wide open. I walked over to it to close it back up, but when I did, I looked down and saw that it was the body of a little girl. My heart ached for her and her family when I saw her. She couldn't have been over eight years old. I noticed that her eyes were gray and cold. Jason, no. Gary yelled as he shoved me to the floor and slammed the freezer shut. It was too late. The little girl's life flashed before my eyes. I could see every bad thing that had ever happened to her. I could feel the pain she had ever experienced. But then, I saw the world from her point of view. I saw myself looking into her eyes and the freezer slamming shut over me. Never look into their eyes. This is why we shut them. Gary yelled. What, what was that? I asked frantically. You saw death, Jason. That is what awaits us all, so it's best to avoid hastening it. He responded. So you mean that we can still see after death? We still experience reality? I asked. So it would seem. Gary replied in a solemn tone. We had lost track of time, and neither of us had noticed that it was around 6 p.m. now. It was getting dark outside. The old man quickly rushed me up the stairs and locked the enormous iron door. Go to your room and lock the door. Now. Gary barked at me. I didn't even ask why. I hurtled up the stairs to my room and locked the door behind me. This place was far too weird for me. I had no intention of staying until the next day. I would leave before my shift began. This was madness. I spent the night tossing and turning unable to find sleep. Instead, I kept reliving that little girl's death and subsequent afterlife. I decided that a walk would be best. I ventured from my room, down the hall, and towards the stairs. I made my way into the spiral staircase and then I heard it. Heavy sounding footsteps were moving towards me. I looked down at my phone and saw that it was 12.56 AM. Shit. Rule 6. I thought to myself. My heart was pounding in my chest as I turned to run back to my room. Something was following me, chasing me back to my room. By the time I slammed the door shut behind me, the thunderous footsteps had been right behind me. The mysterious prowler of the hall continued to pace outside my door as I cowered in the corner for hours. I stayed lodged in the corner of my room long after the footsteps faded away back down the stairs. Eventually, so many hours had passed that the lights went out. I remembered this time. Rule seven, stay put, got it, thought to myself.
I continued to cower in the corner of my room. Come hell or high water, I would not leave the corner. Or so I thought. Not two minutes after the lights went out, I heard quiet sobbing from the other side of my bed. There was someone or something in the room with me. I slowly crawled from the corner and navigated around the edge of the bed, craning my head around the corner of the bed. I strained my eyes to see the outline of a little girl. She was wearing an old looking dress, tattered and dirty. She buried her face into her hands as she wept profusely. Before I could avert my gaze, she lifted her head to look directly at me. Her eye sockets were bloody caverns where eyes had once been, but she still stared directly through me. Her mouth opened wide, revealing only bloody, mangled gums as she let out a haunting shriek. Suddenly, the battered little girl crawled towards me as she continued to scream. When she was around arm's length from me, a human hand, covered in blood, shot from her mouth and fixed itself to my throat. I tried to peel the hand away, but its grip was vice-like. I could feel the air being squeezed from my lungs as I stared into her hollow face. Remembering rule eight, I realized that I was going to die. She continued to scream as I gasped for air. The world was going black around me when a flash of light assailed my eyes. Within an instant, I drew air into my lungs. She had vanished. The lights had come back on. Thankfully, I survived the horrific encounter, and I immediately began packing my things. I would not spend another hour longer in that house. I marched my things down the stairs and towards the front door, but before I could open the door, a voice called out to me. Leaving so soon? Gary's voice called out from behind me. Yeah, I'm leaving, you madman. What in the hell is this place? I asked him in a harsh tone. Jason, calm down for one moment and hear me out. That's all I ask. Gary pleaded. Hear you out? I was just attacked by a child from hell. I responded. You looked? And you're still alive? Interesting. Gary said. His eyebrows raised as he spoke. What do you mean, saw her? I asked, now livid. Mary Baker. She got out of the limb freezer around 38 years ago. That's why we keep them locked. He replied as if I should have known that. Ah, uh, yeah. The corpse just woke up and got out. That makes perfect sense. I barked sarcastically. There's no need to be harsh, Jason. Obviously, she is a handful. It's not like I can just catch her. Avoiding her is just easier. He replied before adding, Jason, this place is special. It's been in the family for generations. My grandmother built it when her husband died. So what? So far we have held a service for a serial murderer. I've been chased down the hall by something and attacked by an evil corpse. I screamed at him. Well, my grandmother couldn't let go of her husband. And when he died, she took up witchcraft. Locals said that she made a deal with the devil to keep him around forever. I guess you could say some of that magic rubbed off on the house. Wait, so the man who chased me up the stairs was also a ghost? I asked, still angry but exhausted now. No boy, we don't deal in ghosts, we deal in cadavers. Uncle Bartholomew is very much a physical being and a real doozy at that. He was grandmother's least favorite. He calmed before adding, That is why it is imperative you follow the rules I gave you. Just then a knock at the front door interrupted our conversation. Gary and I looked at each other in unison. We said, Rule 9. We stood there frozen for a minute, just looking at each other. Gary? Who is that? I asked in a quiet, exasperated tone. Sometimes the devil likes to come to check on the place. He was very fond of this house when my grandmother was alive. Gary replied in a hushed tone before adding, Please think about what I said. I would love for you to stay. I believed the strange old man. I knew, without a doubt, that Satan was standing on the front porch. I promptly went back upstairs and waited until daybreak, still unable to sleep. I stuck around until business hours so I could talk to Gary. Gary? If I follow the rules to the letter, will I stay alive? I asked plainly. I'm 160 years old and still kicking. He replied. Come again? I asked. I was born on June 14th, 
1853. He said, 